Hello, everyone. Welcome to Haskell 102. A quick show of hands. Who wasn't here for one of the 101 sessions this week? OK, so you're the two new people. <laughs> Three. Oh, you were not here for the 101? OK, so hi, I'm Antoine. I'm a Cloud Big Table Series based in Dublin, just traveling to, for the week to organize the sessions. And I, I use they, them pronouns. And welcome to Haskell 102. So I started 101 yesterday by saying that the point of 101 was to help people get started, as in Haskell has a steep learning curve, and the point was to give everyone all the tools that they need to write their own programs in Haskell. If you have tried writing some Haskell since 101, which in your case is kind of unlikely, but still, you might have realized there are a few things that are still missing. So the point of today is to finish what we started in 101, as in, do the tour of all the things you need to know to be able to be independent with Haskell. So yesterday, we talked about the basic skills. What do function types look like? How do we do pattern matching? How do we declare new data structures? And today, we're going to go, go a bit further. We're going to talk about genericity, generic functions, and so on. How to deal with IO, because that's the main pain point that remains. And the code lab today is not going to be simply just rewriting the functions of the language, like map, filter, fold, and so on. It's going to be a, a, sm a small game. Don't get your hopes up. It's a common line game. But still, it's a small project that you can like, improve and iterate on. Uh, same thing as yesterday. I, ha I have roughly one hour of slides and an hour and a half of exercises. If you haven't done the setup for the exercises, we can do it during the break. And again, please do ask questions. So the roadmap for today, I'm going to start with a small one-on-one -on -one recap, just to make sure it's all fresh in your minds. And I'm then going to do a list of the remaining obstacles, the problems you might have faced as beginners if you have tried writing Haskell on your own, and the things we're going to try to solve today. To solve them, I'm going to introduce one thing of the language I haven't talked about yet, type classes. I'm going to show a quick tour of the most important type classes you need to know about. And then I'm going to talk about the advanced syntax they provide which means more or less today is going to be type classes, type classes, type classes, a bunch of them. So the checklist, I assume you all have either been to 101 or have a 101 equivalent level, but we're going to do a recap anyway. You will need to download the code lab to be able to do the exercises and to, to install the compiler, but we can do that during the break if you haven't done so yet. OK, so let's recap 101. This was the most important slide yesterday, so I hope you, you remember it. If you don't remember, basically, we all functions are carried by default in Haskell, which means a function f, such as this one, which takes two ints, returns an int, which we can think of as a function of two arguments, is actually under the hood a function that takes one argument and returns a new function, which takes a second argument, and so on. Which means, as far as the compiler is concerned, this declaration of f is exactly the same thing as this declaration of f. You can think of f as a function of two arguments or as a function of one argument that returns a function which gives us partial application for free, which means f of 1 is a valid expression, whose type is function from int to list of int. We can use that, that, that f of 1 expression as a function itself. Apply it to 2, we'll get a list of ints. And of course, since the language allows us to think of f as a function of two arguments and gives us all the syntactic sugar we need, we can just write f12. This is the most important slide yesterday. Is that clear for everyone? No questions with that? OK, perfect. We saw data types. We said that since we are in a purely functional language, the only thing that matters when we create a type is to declare how to create values of the type. That's the only thing that matters. And when we create the type, we give its name, and we list the constructors, either constants or functions, that will create a valid expression of our type. So if we have only constants, we just have enum-like types, like Boolean, which is either false or true. And through the slides, I'm going to use, as an example, a very small, simple type, color, which is either red or green or blue. We've seen also the struct-like syntax, which allows us to like, name the fields of the constructors. So here I'm creating a point type, which has only one constructor, point. It's a convention to name the, the constructor the same way as the type if you have only one. And the two fields, x and y, are doubles which also creates x and y functions that extract, extract the fields out of, the, out of a expression of the type. And we've seen some more interesting, interesting types. We've seen how to wrap a type, like, like minutes yesterday. We've seen the maybe type, which represents something optional, because a value of, of type maybe a is either nothing, which contains nothing, or just some a, which wraps a value. 
And we've seen a simple example of a linked list. And the reason we saw it is because that's the way the built-in built list is implemented. Is that clear for everyone as well? OK, perfect. We also saw how to declare our own functions. We give the type, which is optional because the compiler is usually able to figure it out, but good convention and a warning if you don't. And then we write the implementation of our function, and we can use pattern matching. We can write, write several implementations based on how the values we have as arguments were constructed. So for Boolean, there's only two constructors, which means there's only two possible Boolean values, which means there's at most two different ways to implement not. Not of true is false, not of false is true. We can use this pattern matching to also deconstruct value. For instance, with point. We know that point has only one constructor whose name is point. But we can use that fact to pattern match the point argument to this magnitude function to get access to the x and y with, with which the point was constructed, and then compute the magnitude. And also, also, of course, you remember the weird syntax of lists. We've spent most of the exercises of 101 going through this weird syntax, where, again, lists are either the empty list or a cell containing a value followed by the rest of the list. Was it, was, is this OK so far? No questions? Perfect. So let's talk. So OK, we know how to read function types. We know how to declare new types. We know how to do pattern matching. Let's talk about what we don't know yet how to do. So first thing, first thing, our types are extremely limited. Let's take an example. I open GHCI. I create my own type. I say data color equals red by green by blue. OK, that works. Simple enough. I have created my own type. I say, let my, my color equals red. Well, that works. I've assigned red to my color, which is kind of useless, but still. But now I want to print my color, just, just to try to see if it prints red, as I expect. And no, that doesn't work. No instance for show color arising from a use of print. We didn't use print ourselves. We can assume GHC did that for us. But we just can't print our value. Of course, that would be a compile time error if you were to try that in the file, but we're in GHCI. And instance and show are words we haven't seen yet. So OK, it's, if you create your own type, you can't debug the values of your type in GHCI. That's kind of sad. But let's go back. We know we can do pattern matching on the values of our own types. So for sure, we can compare for equality, right? Well, no, we can't. No instance for EQ color arising from a use of equal equal. So yeah, if we create our own types, we don't know yet how to make them work in GHCI, in GHCI, how to print values of them, how to compare them for equality. We don't know how to extend our types to make them work with existing functions. So that's the first, first pain point we we're going to want to solve today. Second one is we don't know how to express type parameter constraints. We have seen yesterday how to write generic functions that take work for any type A, any type B, but we don't know how to make them work for some type A or some type B. For, for, to, take, to take an example, at some point in your first program, you need to compute the sum of a list of ints. Well, you write the function of the list, sum i, which takes a list of ints and returns an int. And what sum i is, is simply a, simply a fold using plus as, as the combination function, zero as the base case, and it computes the sum of the list. At some point in your same program, you need to compute the sum of a list of double values. So you write the function on the right, which takes a list of doubles, returns double, and it does a fold using plus as the combination function and zero as the base case. Those two functions are the exact same, yes? Oh, it's fold, pri fold L prime. Uh, there is a very good uh, Haskell Wiki article about the different folds and which one you want to choose. Fold L prime is the one you usually you choose for performance because, well, fold L is still called optimizable. And fold L prime, usually it's a convention. Not all libraries do this. But when you have two different versions of a function, one, one uh, without the prime and one with the prime, the one without the prime is lazy and the one with the prime is eager. And in the case of fold L prime, uh, it's eager in the evaluation of the accumulator to avoid growing the memory. So if you want raw performance, usually for that prime is the very. Yeah. No. It's just plus is an operator. So if you want to use it as a function, to give it as an argument to another function, you need to surround it with parentheses. So at some, at some point in your program, you end up with those two functions. And they have the exact same implementation. So you don't want to have to write a different sum function for every single type. So you write this. Sum takes a list of A's 
written an A, and some does a fold using plus and zeros the base case. And that doesn't work. No instance for num A rising from a use of plus. So clearly, there's a common thing here. We don't know how to extend our types, and we don't know how to express the fact that we want our types to conform to some kind of constraints. The third thing that you don't know how to solve yet, and that you might have encountered as beginners, is the problem of the cascading maybe, the staircase of maybe. Let's take a small example. Let's assume I have three functions. I'll just give that type here. Let's just assume they exist. Three lookup functions, get user, get next of kin, and get phone number. Each three of them takes a key and returns a maybe value. Because, well, maybe there is no, such, no value for such key. Like you get user of zero, and there's no user zero, for instance. So I have those three lookup functions. Each of them returns a maybe value. And I want to chain them. I want, want to combine them to create a monstrosity, which is get next of kin phone number. Takes an ID and goes through the functions to give me a phone number. Shouldn't be that hard, right? So let's write it. I call get user on my user ID. And I use the case of to like pattern match on the result of the get user. There is two possibilities. Either it gave me nothing, and my whole function returns nothing, or it gave me a user. In which case, I can call get next of kin on my user, which gives me two possibilities. Either nothing, in which case my entire function returns nothing, or next of kin ID, in which case I can call get user on my next of kin ID, and either my function returns nothing, and my whole thing returns nothing, or it gives me the next of kin, and I can call get phone number. I hope you agree with me this is disgusting. And clearly, there's a pattern here. Either something returns nothing, and I can short circuit to nothing, or it gives me the next value, and I can keep chaining functions. So clearly, there's a way to avoid that horrible staircase. But as beginners, you will have done that kind of stuff. And we will see today how to solve that problem. The fourth and last pain point we're going to want to solve today is how to deal with IO. Because I mentioned a lot of things about IO yesterday, but we haven't seen yet a single way to use IO values. Because first and foremost, we cannot apply regular, regular functions on IO values. Let's take a small example. I open GHCI. I say late name equals get line. Get line is an IO string, which means when it's evaluated, it's going to perform some side effects. In this case, read a line from the standard input and returns <coughs> that as a string wrapped in IO. That works. But if I try to print hello plus the name, well, that fails to compile, of course, because concatenation works on strings, not on IO strings. So we don't know how to apply functions, but we can't apply functions to IO values. Well, what else can we do? Maybe we can get the value out of IO then to apply functions to it. Well, no. Remember, we don't take values out of IO. IO is impure. Well, at this point, we can't apply functions on IO values. We can't get the values out of IO. What's the only thing left that we know how to do? Pattern matching, right? Well, we can't pattern match on IO. Everything about IO is hidden, private, and get away from us. So we don't know how to deal with IO. At this point in your Haskell journey, if you try to do get line, you have no idea how to use the result of it. So that's the fourth thing we're going to solve today. We don't know how to extend our types. We don't know how to express type constraints. We don't know how to chain contextual functions. And we don't know yet how to use IO. To solve all of this, I'm going to introduce type classes. So purists hate me for saying this. But you can think of them as interfaces. They're kind of the same. As in, they define a contract, and some types, some ty some types uh, match that contract or not. So what you have here is the type class show. And what it says is, a type A is a proper instance of show. In object-oriented lang languages, you would say, you would say implements, implements the interface show. <laughs> if it provides a show function that takes a value of that type A and returns a string. It's the two-string interface, if you will. Again, I'm going to use the color type as my example. So how do I make my color type a proper instance of the show type class? How do I implement show for my type? Well, I just say that my type color is an instance of show, and I implement show for it by just using simple pattern matching. Show of red is the string red. Show of green is the string green. Show of blue is the string blue. One way in which uh, um, interfaces are different from type classes, one way in which type classes are better is that the the like declaring my type and implementing the type class are two separate things, which means if I create my own type class for some kind of library, like a JSON library, for instance, 
I can implement it for types that already exist. Okay, basically with this idea of a type class is kind of like an interface that declares a list of things that the type should match, and then a type explicitly implements those functions to make it a proper instance. Are you okay with this idea so far, more or less? Okay, a quick question. What does the type of show look like if we open GHCI and, and type colon T of show? Because it's not going to be take an A written as a string because it doesn't work for all A's. It works only for A's, which are instances of show. The answer is this. Show is a function that takes an A and it is a string if that A is an instance of show. And that condition is expressed that way with the show of A and double arrow of precondition. Of course, I have a pretty fire for my slides. You would type equal and angle bracket. So that's the way we express type constraints. We can write generic functions and express the conditions we want on our types. That's also a way in which type classes are different. I can express more than one condition per argument. I could write a function that takes one argument of type A and express the fact that this type A needs to be showable, it needs to be comparable for equality, I need to be able to convert it to JSON, I need to, I could express several constraints on only one of, one of the arguments. Okay, so far basically, the thing is this syntax of precondition on, on types of, of, my, of my function is not only for functions declared in type classes, if I want to write my own function that requires some precondition, the syntax is the same. The way to write the sum function we have seen earlier we didn't know how to write is simply to say, wait, well, sum takes a list of A's written in A, but that those A's have to be num, which is the type class that provides plus, and a few other things. Okay with this? And basically the syntax is the same, which means if you see equal equal and you see that it's EQ of A, the precondition, you don't know if equal equal itself is part of the type class or not. And in a way, you don't really care. It's just those A's have to be instances of the EQ type class, which as the name suggests, provide the, the means to compare for equality. Okay, basically, there is one more uh, place where we might need this precondition arrow, and it's for instance declarations. And to explain why, let me show you an example. We want to write the instance of show for maybe A, but maybe is a generic type. We don't want to have to write the instance for maybe ints, for maybe strings, for maybe lists. We want to just write one instance for maybe A, whatever A is. So let's write it. Show of nothing is the string nothing. There is no value to print, easy. And show of just X is the string just, concatenated to show of x. And that doesn't work. Is it obvious to everyone? If it's not obvious, can someone guess? Sorry? Exactly. x is of type a, and we are calling show on that x value, but nowhere we have said that this a type is itself an instance of show, which is why we need the precondition arrow here as well. We can say a, such a thing as, if the type A is an instance of show, then maybe A will also be an instance of show. Okay, with that, we'll see more type classes, of course, during the exercises, but are you basically okay with this idea of it express con constraints, and then we can use that for like, constraints in function, constraints in instances, and all that stuff. Okay, perfect. So let me show you a quick tour of like the main six type classes you will need to know about, which are ubiquitous in the language. Again, I'm going to use this color type as my example, which again is either red or green or blue. So the first one is show. You have heard about it already. It takes a value, returns a string. It's the two string interface. So show of blue will be the string blue. Read is the opposite. It takes a string, returns a value. So if I call read of green and I ask this expression to be of type color, it's going to give me green. I personally dislike read for two reasons. The first one is the read function itself is partial, as in if I try to read z the string zero as a color, it panics. And also implementing the read type class for our type is not really straightforward because we have to implement a parser-like function that takes a string and returns a list of possible matches, which are tuple of match and rest of string. It's complicated to implement, so let's not implement it for color in the slides and let's skip it. Next is EQ, the equality type class. 
which asks a type to provide equal equal, which compares to value for equality, and different, which in Haskell is not exclamation point equals, but slash equals. I know it's weird. So you're thinking, well, maybe we could define one using the other. We don't need to define both. And you would be absolutely right. And in type classes, you can write default implementations, which means by default, A equals B is not A different from B, and A different from B is not A equals B, which, of course, is recursive. But the point is, when you implement this type class for your own type, you don't have to implement both functions. It's enough to implement either one of them, and the other one will use the default implementation that just calls the one you've implemented. Usually, the documentation for a type class will always tell you what's the minimum viable implementation, as in what's the strict minimum you need to implement for the type class to work. And of course, if you want more specific, more specific or for performance reasons, perhaps you want to implement all of them, you're welcome to do so. OK, for EQ? OK, let's Oh, sorry, I forgot that I have this. Implementing EQ for, co for, for color is therefore just saying red equals red, green equals green, blue equals blue. Everything else is false. And the, the, the implementation, implementation for different will be inferred from the implementation of, of equals. Let's move on to ORD. And this slide is starting to get boring. So ORD is your type has a total order, which means you can compare two values. Ordering is a small enum type, which, which gives you either less than, equal to, greater than. Uh, all the comparison operators, max, min. Thankfully, the minimum viable definition is only either one of those two, but still. We could implement it for color, saying that red is less than green and green is less than blue, but that would be verbose. Let's not do it. Bounded. Bounded is interesting because it showcases the fact that the, the things you require in a type class don't have to be functions. They can be values of your type. Here, bounded means there is a value in your type which is greater than all the others, the max bound, and the value which is lower than all the others, the mean bound, and those are not functions which means any place in which your program expects a value of your type A, you can use mean bound or max bound. And finally, enum, which is kind of horrible with it, if you look at it, its all definition, but basically means you can enumerate the values of your type. You can convert from an index to a value of your type and vice versa. From a given value, you can go to the next or the previous, that kind of stuff. Of course, half of those functions are partial and implementing them is a pain. OK, so I've been saying this is a tour of the six most important type classes that you will see everywhere. And for several of them, I've been saying they're a pain to implement, and there's too much stuff. There's kind of like a contradiction here, right? Well, not necessarily. It would be great if, since those type classes are absolutely everywhere in the language, the compiler knew about them and was able to generate good enough default implementations for them, right? Well, the Turns out it can. The deriving keyword does that. If uh, when you declare your type, you say deriving and the list of type classes, the compiler will generate a good enough default implementation of that type class for your type. Sadly, it only works with type classes the compiler knows about or is able to just derive trivially, which is not that many. But at least for those main ones you will see everywhere, it's the case. Sadly, you cannot extend the compiler's knowledge of type classes just in pure language terms, you would need to write a compiler extension, which is a bit more work. But at least when you create your own small type, instead of having to write show yourself, write EQ yourself, write ORD yourself, you can just add deriving all of them, and it just works. Of course, you don't have to derive all of them. You can just derive the ones you need and then manually implement, manually implement the ones for which you want some specific behavior. It's going to be extremely it's going to be extremely simple, like show is going to show red with a capital R, read is going to only accept green with a capital G, uh, egg is going to say that red equals red, thankfully, or is going to say that red is less than green, green, green is less than blue, bounded is going to say that red is the mean bound, blue is the max bound, and enum is going to say that zero is red, one is green, two is blue, as you would expect. Okay with this? So thanks to type classes, we have solved two of the problems we wanted to solve today. We know how to extend our types. If we create a type, the way to make it work with existing functions in the language and libraries is to, well, just make that, make that type instance an instance of the type classes that we, that we need. That's also the way we express type constraints. 
as in if you want to write a generic function that requires something out of its arguments, we just list the type classes that provide the things we require. Let's move on to chaining contextual functions. So I've, the example I've been showing was a cascade, cascading maybe. So why am I not showing a solution that just works for maybe? Well, the answer is simple. That problem of you have something that wraps another value and you will have a chain of cascading stuff is a thing that happens with several types and not just maybe. So thankfully, there's a solution in the language to deal with that. And I'm going to show you the generic solution instead of showing a solution that just works for maybe. So let's see a few types that I consider to be interesting in this case. The context wrapper types that provide additional information to a type and will lead to that cascading problem. So if A is our value type, the value of type A is the value we're interested in, a maybe A is an optional value. We may or may not have a value of that type. List of A is a repeated value. We may have zero, one or more values of our type. And of course, IOA is an impure value value obtained through the effects. In the slides, I'm going to use the notation C of A to mean A value A in a given context C, whatever C is, usually one of those three. OK, with the idea of let's try to solve the cascading thing for all types and not just maybe. So to try to see how we could solve it in a generic manner, let's try to see what those three things have in common. Well, the first thing is wrapping is trivial. Taking a value, putting it inside the context, is trivial. If I have just one element and I want to create a list of elements out of it, I just create a list of one element that contains my value. If I have one element and I want to create a maybe value out of it, I just use a just constructor whose goal it is. For IO, we don't know yet. I have said yesterday that there are functions that take something pure and put it in IO. We have seen none of them yet. One of them is called return, which is not a great name for a function because we are used of, to it being a keyword in other languages. But yes, we can use return to put a value in IO. So all of them have in common that taking a value, putting it inside the context, trivial. However, getting a value out of the context is non-trivial, destructive, or downright impossible. How do you unwrap nothing? If nothing is your maybe int, what's the int you should take out of that nothing? You need a default value to do this, or panic, which is not great. How do you unwrap a list of value? Do you take the first value, the last value, the average value? And even if you choose something, taking a value of the list is a destructive operation. You cannot recreate the list out of the value you extracted. And of course, we do not take values out of IO. So putting stuff in context, trivial, taking stuff out of context, downright impossible, which means if we want a generic solution to deal with, I have some contextual stuff and I want to chain computations in them, we are not going to be able to just unwrap, do the thing we wrap. We are going to need to do the computations while staying in the context. And the answer is therefore, of course, type classes. We will need those context types to implement type classes that all allow us to manipulate the values inside them without no having to know how they work. There are three main type classes that are used by context to provide the kind of functionalities, but I'm not going to talk about them. I'm going to talk about the actual functions they provide because that's, that's the thing which is interesting. There are three main functions that provide that cover all the base cases on how to deal with context. Some of them are a bit too low level and we use better functions than those functions actually, but they cover all like the theoretical base and from that we can create all the powerful abstractions we want. The first of those three functions is fmap. And it might look familiar, and that's for a reason. I'm going to show examples of how it works and what it means exactly in the next slide. But basically, it takes a, fun a conversion function from A to B, a value A inside a given context C, and provided, of course, that the context C implements a type class that provides fmap, it will return a, um, a value B inside the same context. The second of those functions is app, short for apply, which is almost the same, except the function itself is inside the context. A maybe function, for instance. Why would we ever want a maybe function? When does that happen? We'll see that when I showcase apply. And last, but certainly not least, because it's the one we're going to use to solve our chaining problem from before, is bind. Bind takes a function which is 
a chaining function, which takes an A, which is not in the context, and returns a B inside the context. And it combines it with a value A, which is already in the context. So those three are, again, the stepping stones of dealing with context, because the three of them cover the three base cases. We want to apply a function to value which is in the context, like a maybe A, for instance, a maybe int. And we have either a normal function, a function which is itself in the, con in the context, or a continuation function, a chaining function, like the lookup functions we had before. And with those three cases, we cover everything, and we can write our abstractions. Even if you don't get how those functions work just yet, which is OK, I'm going to showcase some examples, does, does this idea of we have three basic fu functions that cover the base cases, and we are going to use them to deal with context, is that OK, more or less, or not? Yeah, sure. It looks like it unwraps, but the thing is, it's, it's, it is implemented in the type class, which means when the type, the, the type, type creator, creator has implemented the type class properly, you actually never unwrap, as in you have your value A in the context C, you apply a function, you get the value B in the context C. At no point, by using this function, you can get the value out of the context. Even if, of course, internally it might need to unwrap and rewrap, as a user, you will never be able to unwrap. At least not with the function. Does that answer your question? Okay. We'll we'll write we will write those three functions for a type during the code lab. Hopefully it will help you understand how that works. Okay, basically with that, if you're okay with this, let's show some examples of how those functions work for the types we have chosen to uh, uh, chosen as, as examples. So again, maybe list and IO. So fmap is like map. So again, that's why it sounds familiar. Map is a function you have seen yesterday. It takes a, a function from A to B, takes a list of values of type A, returns a list of values of type B. Well, fmap is the same, but is generalized to all contexts. So map is just a normal function defined on its own. fmap is a function part of a type class, and the implementation of fmap on different contexts, well, depends on the context, but for list, it's, it's just map. So fmap on a list is exactly map. So fmap of show on the list one, two, three will be the list of strings one, two, three. No surprise here. But fmap also works on maybe. So fmap of show on a maybe int, in this case, just 42, is going to be just the string 42. We have transformed that maybe int in, in a maybe string by applying a function inside the maybe, because maybe has implemented the type class that provides fmap. OK with this? Of course, fmap of, of a function on nothing is still nothing. And interestingly, fmap of length, which takes a string, returns an int, on getLine, which is an IO string, well, I can't give you the value because my slides don't have a standard input, but the type is IO int. So despite the fact that this section of the slides is not about how to deal with IO, it's about this cascading context problem, we see that the things we are using, we are, we are like uh, learning here to deal with context are going to be useful to actually deal with IO later. Because here, we just applied a pure function to a value inside IO, thanks to the fact that IO implements that type class. OK, with fmap, we have a type that wraps a value, and we, thanks to fmap, we apply functions on the value inside the type. OK, with this? Do you remember the curse of Haskell? A thing where you can create your own operators, which doesn't mean you should. Well, I'm sad to say that FMAP has its own operator version. So yeah, you will need to learn about it, not because I encourage you to use it, but because if you try to read Haskell code in the world, in the wild, you will see it. It looks like this. A way to remember it is, well, dollar is function application, and this is function application inside the context. Don't know if that works for you. OK, so that's FMAP. That's one out of, out of three. Let's, yeah, sorry, yeah. I'm just, I'm just saying that contexts are those types that implement the type classes that provide fmap, apply, and bind. I, I'm just using this idea of context to explain how they work, because that's, that's, that thing is the, most, the simplest explanation uh, I can give. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expand on, on, on the actual types later when I, I like generalize to beyond just list, IO, and, and maybe. Um, so that's the first one, fmap. Let's talk about apply. 
Apply asset is, is the one I like the least because its syntax is horrible, but apply solves a practical problem that might arise from the use of fmap. What, hap what happens if you fmap a function that takes more than one argument on a value inside the context? For instance, let's take an example. I want to compute the sum of two maybe ints. If one of them is nothing, or both of them are nothing, it's just going to be nothing. But if both of them are just a value, well, I want just the sum. So how do I deal with the int inside the maybe without extracting into the default value or something? Well, we can use fmap. So I use fmap of my plus function on my first maybe int. It happens to be just three. OK, that works perfectly. But the problem is plus takes two arguments. So when I fmapped it on just three, what I got is just three plus, which is a maybe function from int to int. So now I have a maybe function. I have my second maybe int. How do I combine a maybe function with a maybe int? fmap does not solve this. That's why app exists, even though, again, app is not great and there's better abstractions built on top of it. The point of app is it takes a function inside the context, a value in the con inside the context, and continues applying the values to the function. So here, I can use this app thing to app my just three plus on a just 39, and I will get my just 42, as I would expect. I know this is not exactly readable, but again, the practical problem it solves is what happens when you fmap a function of more than one argument. Remember the curse? Of course, it also has an operator version. It's star between brackets, and this one I have no idea. Yeah? Of course, of course, but in this case, I'm, tr I'm trying to compute the sum of two maybe ints. So I have my plus function. My first argument is a maybe int. My second argument is a maybe int. And I need, I need to put the, the function inside the context and then continue applying the arguments inside the context. And that's the problem that app solves, even if, again, its syntax as itself is kind of ugly and there are better functions that exist. There's, there's a bunch of lift functions that transform a function to function inside the context based on app. But app is the theoretical like stepping stone, so that's why we have to cover it. So app has an operator version. And since fmap also has an operator version, we can write one of the most controversial syntax in the entirety of Haskell. Some people hate it. Some people love it. If I want to apply my plus function onto maybe ints, I can just use plus, fmapped onto the first one, applied onto the second one, and I get my result. If you find this hard to read, don't worry. You might you will not necessarily have to deal with it. Yes? How do we know uh, any rules of thumbs what binds stronger than other things? You, you can always inspect in GHCI if you call an I an operator, it's gonna tell you whether whether it's left associative, right associative, and what its pri its priority is. Like for instance, well, let me open the GHCI. Is that big enough? <laughs> OK, perfect. So if you look at, for instance, uh, the dollar operator, it's right associative, it's infix r, and its priority is 0. And if we look at, another, at the plus plus operator, which is a concatenation we created yesterday, it's right associative as well, but its priority is 5. It's going to apply before uh, dollar, which has the lowest priority of them all. OK, with the app, I know its syntax is ugly, but again, the thing I want you to keep in mind is it solves the practical problem of how do I keep applying uh, contextual values to my function. And again, there are better abstractions based on top of it. But based, are you OK with the general idea of it? Oh, OK, perfect. Which means we can move on to bind. And um, bind is the interesting one again, because it's the one that solves the cascading problem we've had before. So let's look, take us an easier example. Let's take div2. Div2 takes an int, returns a maybe int. If the int is even, like 42, it returns just a half, 21. If that int is odd, it returns nothing, because we can't compute div2 of an, of an odd int. Pretty simple. I want to write div4, but I'm a lazy person. And remember, in Haskell, being lazy, lazy is a good thing. So instead of writing it ourselves and having to compare with modular operation and so on, we just want to chain two calls to div2, which is going to do the exact same thing. So let's do it that way. I have x, which is an int. I say, I say let y equals div2 of x. I do the first div2. And y is a maybe int. 
So I can't just apply diff to omit. I need to apply it inside the maybe int. And I know how to apply functions inside of a, a context, right? I use fmap. So I fmap div to on y. And that doesn't work. Can someone tell me why? It's a maybe, maybe int. Can everyone see it? So y is a maybe int. And then I fmap div to, which takes an int and it turns a maybe int inside the maybe. So it transforms, transforms my int into a maybe int. But that thing was already inside the maybe, so I get a maybe, maybe int, which is not what we want. We have no idea if there's a way to like compress them, join them into one single maybe. So we need something else. And that's the point of bind. Bind it takes a chaining function that takes a value and it turns a value in the context and chains it with something which was already in the context. So here, if we if we simply replace fmap with bind, it actually works. To put it on one line, div4 of x is bind div2 on div2 of x. Of course, it also has an operator version, which kind of looks like the Haskell logo, maybe, perhaps. I actually like this one because the point of div, since the point of it is to, of div, of bind, sorry, since the point of it is to chain functions, the fact that it has like this weird shape makes it pretty explicit we are creating pipelines. Let me show you. So d4 is div2 of x that we just bind into the next step, which is also div2. If we want to write div8, I just have to bind into div2 once more. If we want to write div16, I just have to bind into div2 once more. The fact that we are creating a pipeline where every single step tries to take the, val take, take the value and uh, returns a next maybe value is made pretty explicit that way. OK, with bind, can you guess how it's going to solve our cascading problem more or less? Um, yeah? Could you write the same implementation for div16 by removing the x? Yes, there's, an, there's another operator, which looks slightly different, that allows you to chain, chain the functions without having to name the first one. Yes, there, there will be a way for this. Uh, I don't show it today because I think it's slightly out of scope, but I can show it to you during, during the exercises. There's a way to do it. And second question, during the I mean, first implementation area, we use let, you use let uh, uh -huh. whatever in whatever. Yeah, absolutely. That. That's, uh, we saw it for some of the examples yesterday. Basically, introduce a local binding as in something which is just local to the function, to the, to the context in which I am. Mm -hmm. So I'm just like, it's just a helper. Like I'm saying, okay, why I could, I don't need why, I just give it a name. It's a local variable if you want, a local binding. Yes. It depends on how bind is implemented for the, for the given type. In the case of maybe, what happens if you have a, a, a nothing instead of a value? It cannot apply the function because there's no, no value, so it just forwards nothing. So what happens in the case of maybe is as soon as this one of those types returns nothing, the whole thing is going to return nothing, which is exactly the behavior we wanted for our horrible get next of kin phone number example. So let's implement it again. But this time we have bind, and we are going to use the operator version again. Because again, that's the point of bind, to solve that kind of problems. Let me show you. We start with the user ID again. We call get user, which gives us a maybe user. What we want is the next step, something that takes the user and returns the next maybe value, the next step of doing a computation that might fail and return nothing. Well, we have such a function. We have get next of kin, which takes a user and returns a maybe ID. So we can just bind into get next of kin, which gives us a maybe ID. We can bind that into get user, which takes a, 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 an ID and a maybe user, and we can bind that into get phone number. And we have solved our cascading context problem. Of course, that example is made to work perfectly. We'll see more interesting examples later. OK, basically, so context wrap values, and we want to be able to deal with them without having to extract, because extracting is not really pos always possible. And we have three functions fmap, apply, and bind that allow us to deal with all the possible cases and like build pipelines within contexts. So I haven't talked about the type classes themselves. And there are two reasons for this. Well, the first reason is some of them are extremely lightweight, like the, the type class that provides fmap only asks the type to provide fmap. There's nothing else, else in it. So talking about the type class would just add additional craft, which was not needed. The other reason is the name 
of the type classes for fmap and apply come directly from category theory. And I didn't want you to, I didn't want to scare you with the names that come again directly from category theory. So let's talk about them. fmap is defined in a type class named functor, the f word. So if you've heard about applicative functors, endo functors, all that stuff, forget all of this. A functor is a type that wraps another type, and you can use fmap to apply functions inside. That's all you need to know. There's a logical dependency between the, the, the three functions, as in to implement apply, a, need, a type needs to already implement fmap. To implement bind, a type needs to already implement apply and fmap. So in what type class is applied is apply defined? Applicative. So that's what an applicative functor is. It's a type that wraps values, and you can use fmap and apply to apply functions inside the type. That's all. Thankfully, bind is defined in a type class that has a way more straightforward name, because bind is defined in monad. That's what a monad is. It's a context that wraps values, and in which you build pipelines by chaining functions that keep returning values inside that context. That's all. That's all you need to know about them. OK, so to sum up, we know how to chain contextual functions, aka monadic functions, as in as soon as we have some kind of type that wraps our values to provide additional information, maybe being at any time we might, ha we might have nothing and we just cross it to nothing, list being at any time we might return more than one value and we want to have the whole tree of values, IO being at any point we might perform side effects and we want to like, keep performing side effects. As soon as we have some kind of context that wrap our values, but we want to keep building normal pipelines of applying functions, we use monads because that's what they're for. Last but not least, how do we use IO? Because yes, IO is a monad. We've seen that it was, it was implementing bind and everything. But is that really the way we want to use, to use it? Because if we look at monad, that's all. That's all there is to it. It's just a type class that says a type M, if it's already an applicative functor, might be a monad if it provides return, that function with a bad name, with a bad name I mentioned, that takes some value and puts it inside the context. That's what it does. And if it provides bind, the operator, because the function doesn't even exist. I made it up for the slides because it was easier to read. The operator is the canonical version, which chains a value already in the context with the next continuation function. That's all there is to monad. However, as I said earlier, those three functions, fmap, apply, and bind, are the stepping stones. They are the theoretical background on which we can build a lot of fascinating but horribly complicated abstractions. So if you start looking at the control.monad documentation page, you will find a lot of fantastic operators. The second one is the one you, you asked about that allows to chain the div2 without having to name the x the fish operator, because it kind of looks like a fish. And if you, by chance, happen to stumble onto a function that has a name and some operator, its type is not necessarily extremely easy to read. And that's the thing about monads. Monads themselves are not complicated. The abstractions you can build on top of them, yes, some of them are. Thing is, do we, do we really need to know all those operators to just do some simple I.O. I want to print something to the, to the command on, on the standard output. I don't want to have to deal with fish operators. Thankfully, there is a thing for us. There's a thing called the do notation, which is some syntactic sugar that allows us to write almost imperative code. And then the compiler transforms that almost imperative code in the corresponding monadic code with all the operators. But we don't have to see them. To see how it's helpful, let's write a small program only using the operators, and then we'll see the do version that is imperative and easy to read. So we have here three functions that already exist. We have get first name, which is an IO string. So it's something that, when evaluated, may or may not perform that effect. In this case, let's assume it does, and gives us a string, which will be the first name of the user. Get last name, same thing, an IO string. When evaluated, might perform that effect and give us a string, which is the last name of the user. And we have a greet user function that takes those two strings, the first name and the last name, and performs an IO action. This empty parenthesis thing, the, the open closing parenthesis, is the empty tuple. And if you remember the non-type non -type from 101, it's the same thing. It's a type that is completely uninteresting because the only possible value of type empty tuple is the empty tuple. 
So it's kind of like void. It's a type that provides you no information whatsoever. It's not much use in pure code because a function that cannot perform side effects and returns you a value which is useless, well, is a function that the compiler will just remove because it can do nothing. But in the case of, of, of monads, and especially in the case of IO, especially in the case of IO where it's the side effects that we care about, sometimes we don't care about what the function returns. The only thing we care, care about is the side effect it does. For instance, print does side effects and returns just an IO action. That's how we call it. We call that empty type, empty tuple uh, unit. And when it's an IO unit, we call it an IO action. And the type of main, the main of our program is simply an IO action, do something. So we want to write an expression. Again, we don't know yet about this magic, uh, this magic uh, notation that allows us to write imperative code. So we have to write, write it using the bind operator. We want to write an expression of type IO unit, IO action, which will be the result of a greet user. And we want to, in order, first get the first name, then get the last name, then greet the user. So let's write it. We start with get first name. That's an IO string, right? So we, want, we know we are already in the context of IO, and we want to chain with the function that will take the string and return the next step of the computation. We know that's the point of bind, to chain into the function that will perform the next step. So we use bind. But we have no function that will take the first name and perform the rest of our main. Thankfully, Haskell is a very modern language. And just like Java 8, it has lambda functions. So I can create a lambda function that will be the function in which we bind to perform the next step. So we bind into a function that takes the first name and will do the next steps of our main. What's the next step? Well, we want to call get last name. And again, that's an IO string. So we've gone one step further in IO. We are still in IO. We have never exited IO despite first name just being a string. But we need to, again, chain into the next step. So again, we use bind. And again, we have no suitable function, so we create a lambda that takes the last name out of get last name and will return the overall main IO action. And what's the overall main IO action? It's simply to greet the user with first name and last name. We have built our first program. Yay, it's still a staircase. So yes, we have managed to get our way around IO. We have managed to chain steps in IO, having every step written an IO value, and we chain that into a function that uses that value to perform the next thing but remains in IO. That's great, but it's not very readable. And that's the point of this do notation, is to make that thing readable. But the thing is, it's not that bad if you remove all the operators, if you remove all the signs, all the things. What's happening line by line? When, well, line by line, I'm calling get first name. I'm locally, temporarily binding it to something named first name. I'm calling get last name. I'm locally, temporarily binding it to something named last name. And I'm, I'm, I'm using those two variables to greet the user. If I could just write it that way, it'd be better, right? It'd be more readable. That's exactly what the do notation does. It allows me to write something which is even better than this. So the do notation is you open the block with the keyword do. Since Haskell is white space sensitive, then everything that comes after is like aligned and that's a block. Of course, you can make it explicit by using uh, curly brackets and semicolons, but no one does that. So how do we write the same thing using imperative like notation in a do block? Well, we say, well, get first name, bind it to first name, get last name, bind it to last name, greet the user. I would claim the second version is a bit more readable than the first. I hope you agree. And that's the thing. We, for dealing with IO especially, we almost never use the operators directly. I mean, at some point, you get used to them and you play with them. But if you want to write readable code, you just use a do block. And it's almost imperative. The step-by-step -step nature of it is made explicit. The thing is, do also works for any other monad. So any time you, have, you want to write several steps and you want like the, the in a given context, for instance, we are going to use it in the code lab to deal with uh, pure error handling. Like we have a type that represents errors, and every step might fail, and we will write bind in such a way that if at some point we have an error, it short circuits. You can use a do block. There are more translation rules to the do block than just bind into a lambda. 
For instance, what happens if you don't care about the value you want to discard it? There's another operator for this. I'm not going to show more translation rules because, again, some of them use operators we haven't seen yet. And the other reason why I'm not going to show more translation rules is you are already familiar with do blocks. Because imagine, imagine something kind of like a do block in which each line is a step. And at every end of the step, we would just print the value. We would call it GHCI. GHCI is basically just a very thin wrapper around a do block in I.O. So what you're used to type in GHCI works almost, right? except the colon T, colon I stuff, of course, works in a do block as well. So that's how we deal with I.O. We use the fact that underneath it has all those interesting properties of being monads and so on. And we don't care about them. We write do blocks and we write imperative code. To recap, oh, sorry, you had a question. Bind bind enforces that what happens first will be evaluated before you apply the function. It's only, it's only with bind. Yes, it's only with. I mean, it depends on how you how it's implemented. But bind has this guarantee, especially for IO, that that every every step will have the steps will happen in order. You don't have that with the uh, fmp and apply, but bind enforces that that chain that continuation logic. Yes. I want to do the same thing, but for whatever reason, I want to reverse the order of characters in last name. Let's say there is already a function called reverse. Yeah, absolutely. Could I simply write the same thing, but last time read user first name, and then I know I'm stupid and parenthesis this reverse last name? One, there's no stupid question. Two, yes, that would absolutely work. Because in a way, even if we are not doing it, it looks like we're extracting the thing out of I.O. We are not. We are giving a function to I.O. We are using a function that I.O. provides that allows us to apply something that takes the thing inside I.O., but it has to return the next step in I.O. Given the functions we have, we cannot give a function that would extract the thing out of I.O., but we locally have access to the thing. So here, first name and last names are indeed strings, so before greeting the user, we could do any transformation on strings that we want, any pure transformation that we want, just like, like calling reverse, for instance. Okay, follow-up question. Uh-huh. From this last question. Um, let's say I don't want to use the parent of this, but maybe I want to write an additional line, something like the reverse name. Mm -hmm. And in the imperative language, I would say reverse name equals reverse last name. Here you would write. Would I put that same thing, reverse name, and then the left? It would be slightly different. The left arrow is used when you have the expression on the right is in your context, in the context of the do, and you locally bind it. If you want to just have a local variable, you just use let. Let reverse name equal reverse last name, and then you use your reverse name. We'll see exactly that, that example at the end of the code lab. Only for IO, or does it work with any context like maybe? It works for every single monad because it just gets translated into bind and that kind of operator. We could rewrite, for instance, if we wanted, let me go back a while. We could rewrite this using, using a do block. We could open do, say, well, the, the user is left arrow of get user UAD. And then the ID is left arrow of get next of key in the thing. And it would be the exact same thing. It would get translated into the same thing. We could use a do block for this. Homework, use a do block for this. Any other question on this? Yes? It's, it, it depends on the context in which you are. As in here, the type of IO, of the type of main, sorry, is IO action. So since main returns an IO something, the compiler knows that this do block is in IO. And given it's always going to be the surrounding context that provides the compiler with the information of what's the monad in which you are. You could also write generic code and just let the compiler infer, well, this has to be a monad. And then depending on how you use the code that has this do block, the compiler will choose the proper one.
We'll see an example of this, not with do blocks, but with the compiler choosing which type class to call, depending on the context in the code lab as well. Yes, sorry, in, in, in back. We could absolutely do grid user fmap get first name apply get last name. The problem with this is that uh, bind guarantees the order of evaluation, and applicative can parallelize because it has no such guarantee. So if your thing can be parallelized, like like querying the the first name and querying the last name can be done parallel, then yes, you can write it in one line in applicative, and suddenly it's parallel. But the question of how to parallelize applicative is way beyond the scope of today. We'd be happy to talk about it during the exercises, but it's beyond the scope. But yes, of course, we could make it into a one liner because we're not doing anything fancy. But <laughs> I'm using to showcase like the original version with all the binds and arrows and everything, which gets translated into a readable tool version. There was another question, I think. Yeah. Uh, in, that, in that case, imagine get first name returns an IO maybe string. So if you, if you use the left arrow, first name here would be a maybe string. And then you have to deal with it. You could open another do block, which itself would be maybe to deal with it. But you cannot have, unless we go into way, way, way beyond the scope of today, there is a thing called monad transformers in which you combine monads into a meta monad that has bind for both of them at the same time. But that's way, way beyond the scope of today. OK with this? So again, to recap. We have seen that type classes are the ways we are the way we extend our own types. We make them instances of the type classes, and suddenly they work with all the functions that require the type classes. That's how we express type constraints. I won't write a generic function, but I require some properties of, on my type. Type classes are the way I do this. All this monad stuff, the whole point, forget anything you've heard before, is just to be able to perform step by step computations in a given context that gives more value to more interesting stuff around my type. And we even ignore all of that, and we just use the denotation mostly when you, we deal with I.O. We can use it for anything else, but the most common case is just using I.O. and doing do, read, print, that kind of stuff. And that's all I have for, today, for you today. You have survived Haskellana 2, and if you, if you fill the grow survey, you will receive a mama badge for that picture. A few more links for you. The slides are at go slash Haskell slash two slash slides. Uh, if you want a more thorough explanation of that whole uh, functor applicative monad and everything, edit.io, the link in the slide is not to the whole site, but to a specific page, page named functors, applicatives, and monads in pictures, where each week the, the site author re-explains the whole thing with pictures, and their pictures are absolutely amazing. For instance, they represent maybe as a gift box, which may or may not contain a present. And the third one is a gigantic cheat sheet, which is named Everything I Wish I Knew When I Started Learning Haskell. And it's topic by topic, the things you need to care about, the things you don't need to care about. How to have a, a build system that works, things you don't need to care about. That's, this is what you need to care about. Topic by topic, monads, functors, everything. Fourth, the Haskell Code Lab, not the one for today, the one maintained by the Haskell team. If you want to try to see what writing Haskell in Google 3 looks like, you can go to the Haskell Code Lab. And, and last, but certainly not least, if you enjoy the brain teasers at the end of, of 101 and you want to use all those operators in absolutely unreadable way, well, code golf might be for you. If you're not familiar with this, golfing is solving a problem in the smallest amount of code in the lowest possible amount of characters. We have a daily contest, and you can participate in Haskell. And that's a very interesting way in seeing what operators on the list monad can do. I would, of course, again, don't make me review code written that way, but to try to see what you can do with all those weird operators, it's extremely fun. And yeah, that's all I have for you. It's 11.10. Let's take a 10 minutes break. And during that time, I'm here to answer questions, and I can help you set up the exercises if you haven't done so yet. So if you have uh, downloaded the code, the code lab uh, zip file and unzipped it, you will see more or less this. There's a few more things than yesterday, but it's still the code lab file, the main file, the solution file, and everything. If you compile it, 
it should compile without, without warnings if you have downloaded the zip file recently enough. And it creates this time, this time four binaries. It creates the test binaries. There is test solution. Of course, you can run them from GHCI if you prefer, because again, Santa is going to be a pain on Max. Test solution runs all the tests on the solution file, and it ensures that your setup is correct. Test code lab runs them on the code lab file, and since, since we have written nothing, they all fail. And the code lab and solution binaries are the actual game. So if we run the solution binary, we see solution play, solution solve. Solution play. So the valid colors are red, yellow, green, cyan, blue, and magenta. The size of the code is four. You have eight tries. Most of my classes solve it in five. The best class solved it in four. Good luck. What do you want to try first? So that's the game we're going to implement today. So if you remember yesterday, we had, uh, let me kill this file. We had the code lab file in which all the code was, 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 uh, was in. Uh, divided by section, and you had to code all the functions. It's the same today with a twist. There's a second file, which is the game file, that contains the code of the game. The difference is there is nothing for you to write in the game file. There's just section by section. The code we write in the code lab file is getting used and expanded on in the game file. So when I give the answers to the code lab file, I will show how we use the things in the, in the game file. So same as yesterday. You have the code lab. You know how to compile it. You know how to test it. I'm going to let you write the code. I'm going to roam around the room, and I'm going to look at your screens. Good luck. OK, perfect. So to define, to make our error or type a monad, we are going to need to define wrap, fmap, app, and bind. So let's define them one by one. So what does wrap does? Well, again, error or a is a context in which we have A values or an error message. Of course, what we hope to have is the A values and error message in case something goes wrong. So wrap is a thing that takes a value and puts it inside the context, the thing we deem to trivial. And indeed, in this case, the only way to put something in an error A, since there's only two constructors, is to use the value constructor. If we call value of x, this is a valid expression of type error or A that wraps a value. Interestingly, if you look at the, if you open GHCI and look at the type of value, value itself is a function that takes an A and returns an error or A, which means wrap value doesn't even need to name X because the type of wrap value is the same as value. So fmap value, we want to write the equivalent of F, equivalent of fmap for our error or type. So we can transform error or strings into error or ints or anything else. We want to apply functions inside the error or without having to test or to extract things out of it. So we always have the function because the function is not inside the context. So we have a function from A to B. But there's two possibilities. We need to pattern match. If we have an error message, we don't have an A value. So we can't apply the function to transform it into a B value. So in that case, the only way to create an error or B is to, is to just forward the error message. The thing a lot of people ask me is, can we just name that thing and reuse it? And no, sadly, we can't, because this error message here is, a, an, is an error A. This error message here is an error B. And the compiler cannot silently convert one into the other. We have to unwrap, rewrap. However, again, the compiler will just optimize that away for us anyway. So if we don't have an error message, we have a value. So our error or A was constructed by wrapping using the value constructor some value x of type A, which means we can call f, which transforms an A into a B on x, and we just have to rewrap this by calling wrap value, for instance, and using dollar if you don't want to use parentheses because yeah, dollar is nice. So then app. App is, of course, the most complicated because, because of course, IP, app is always the most complicated. So in the case of uh, app, we have two things in the context. So we need to choose what happens in the case we have two error messages. Which one do we keep? And in the case of app, since we're going to do something sequential using the, using the denotation, 
the function uh, appli uh, applying the function to the first argument is the thing that gonna that that gonna happen first. So if there was an error at this point, we want to keep the error which was on the function side, not on the argument side, which is why I've written it that way. If there was an error in the function, we don't even care whether the value is an error or not. We don't even need it because that's not always going to happen first. So in the case where there is no function, whether the value is correct or not, we don't care because we anyway, even if we have a value, we can't transform it anyway. So in the case where the function only contains an error, we just forward the error. However, if our error or function actually contains a function f, well, we need to combine this function f with an error or a. We could write pattern matching here. We could try to say, well, we have a value f and an error message and return the error message, the value f and the value a, and then just apply f of a, but we don't need to because we have already done something, done something that does that for us. We have done f map value. So we can f map value f on the error or a. And finally, bind, which is way simpler than app in many ways, because the function this time is not in the context. We have just a normal function, so we don't have to test for it. And either the value itself is, is an error, in which case we don't have an a value on which to apply the function, so we just forward the error message again, or we have a value x of type a. We have a function that takes some a, returns an error, or b. We just apply the function f on x, and we have an error or b. OK, so let me first check that I didn't make a mistake, because I will make mistakes. Seems to compile, so that there's that already. OK, it passes the test. So that's section one. Let's have a look at the game file for section one. In section one, in the game file, I'm using those four functions we have defined to make error or a proper monad. So how do we do this? Well, we say that error or is a proper functor. And the only thing required to make it a functor is to define fmap. And fmap is simply, of course, fmap value. Then we make it an applicative. We have to declare pure, which is simply wrap. The reason we have wrap twice is for historical reasons. Uh, applicative was added to the language after monad was added to the language. For, for a long time, there was no logical dependency between the two. It's been fixed. And yes, pure is also a terrible name, just like return, because when you have something which is not in I.O., pure, and you want to make it impure by putting it in I.O., you can use the pure function. Yes, that's how it is. So pure is simply wrap value, takes something, puts, puts it inside the context, and apply, which by default is the operator, operator version, is simply app value. And finally, we can make error or a monad with the two only things that are required, which is return, which is also simply wrap value, and the bind operator, which is flip bind value. So what's flip? Let's open GHCI, current t flip. Flip takes a function that takes an A, a B, returns a C. Transform it into a function that takes a B, an A, returns a C. It flips the two first arguments. And the reason for that is we've defined bind as being first the function, second the contextual value, while the operator is first the value, then the function. So we flip the function, and then we have the proper type. And we can say that bind is simply flip bind value. And now our error or, error or type is a monad. In section two, we deal with colors and weird type classes. So section two, we define the color type, which we're going to use for the game. So that's where the color in the game comes from. Again, it's just red or yellow or green or cyan or blue or magenta. And we are using deriving to derive ord, egg, enum, and bounded for us. So green is less than cyan, cyan is less than blue. We can enumerate values of the type. And bounded gives us the mean bound being red and the max bound being magenta. Spoilers. So we have only one question in section two, which is we want to write something that gives us a list of all the colors. Of course, we could write it by saying all colors equals red, comma, yellow, comma, green, and so on. But that's not great because it's super not robust. If I change something, well, first I have to type everything myself. 
And if I change the color, it becomes wrong. So let's not do this. Instead, let's use the fact that enum, the enum type class gives us enum from two, which is a function that will enumerate values from one to the other. For instance, if I open GHCI and I type enum from two of zero and 10, it will generate the list of zero to 10. And there is syntactic sugar for this in the language, the dot dot thing. So zero dot dot 10 will be zero to 10. So we're gonna go from the minimum color to the maximum color, and it's gonna generate the list of colors for us. Here, there's a trick. A lot of people choose to write red and magenta because it works, right? This is the minimum color. This is the maximum color. It passes the test. It works, but it's the bad answer. Because what happens if I change things? Like blue comes before magenta, it comes after magenta, or if I add another color, purple, for instance, and suddenly your all colors is broken. The thing to realize is we also derive from bounded, which gives us mean bound and max bound. So instead of saying explicitly, well, the minimum color is red, we can say that the minimum color is the mean bound and the maximum color is the mean bound. A lot of people use the colon colon thing to say, well, it's not just any mean bound, it's a mean bound of type color and max, bound, and max color is a max bound of type color because other, otherwise, how is the compiler gonna know that this is a color and this is a color? The thing is, you don't need that. Because you, we've been saying to the compiler, all colors is a list of color. This is a call to enum from two, which returns a list of A's for A being the type of the arguments. So since it's returning a list of colors, the arguments have to be of, of type color. Therefore, those two things are of type color and the compiler chooses the correct mean bound and max bound implementation. Let's go one step further. If I remove this, it still compiles. Can you guess what's the type inferred by the compiler in this case? Since we don't tell the compiler those are colors, what, the, what will, what will, what implementation of enum and, and of bounded the compiler will choose? Can someone guess? Exactly, it's not gonna choose a type. If we don't say to the compiler, those are colors, what the compiler will, will say well, is, well, that thing here, well, it's a list of A's because we're returning a list. And since we're using enum, well, that, those A's have to be enum. And since we are using bounded, well, those A's have to be bounded as well. That's what the compiler would generate, would understand from this code. And by saying, well, actually, it's not just any A, it's color, we're making its life simpler. Of course, if we, were, if, we, if we were keeping this version, which A it is and which enum and bounded instance to choose would depend on where we use that thing. If we were to use that all colors thing in the context that expects a list of int, the compiler would choose the instance of enum and bounded for ints. If we were to use it in the context that expects a list of colors, the compiler would choose the, the mean bound and max bound and uh, enum instances for color. Make sense? Up, so color and this. Just to have, yeah, sorry, yeah, go ahead. In a way, there is, uh, there is like overload by uh, by it's overload by type class to be to be to be fair. I think type class is the only way where you can have a thing that has the same name for different types. A normal function? No, you can't. Because a function is only declared once. So you can't first declare it returning an int and then declare it returning a string because a function is always declared once. Type classes are the only way we have some kind of overload. And let me see if I have some section two. I have some stuff in section two uh, in the game file. So we do several things with this color type. First, we write our own show instance. We don't derive it because we don't want the default implementation. We want our own. We want to just display one letter at a time, which is how the game behaved. So show of red is just going to be the string R. Show of yellow is just going to be the string yellow, Y, and so on. We also define, we don't use the read type class. We define our own read function that takes a given character, because strings are just a list of characters, and returns an error or color. So we use our error or, ty error or type 
to indicate the fact that this read color might either return a value of type color or fail with an error message. So if we try to read the character R, we just return the value red. If we try to read the character Y, we return the value yellow, and so on. And if none of those patterns match, then we have some character C, which was none of those. In which case, instead of returning a value, we return an error message, which, which is that character C is not a proper color. If you try to play the game, solution play, and you try to input as a color red, 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 and purple, P is not a proper color. OK, so that's section two. Onwards to section three about color maps. So here, I recommend you have a look at documentation of maps. The hackage style of documentation is not the easier to read, but since it's the only one used, if you get familiar with it, it's going to be way easier every time you need to look at some documentation. So we are going to use it to represent what a code is like in terms of, of colors. So a code such as red, red, green, blue in a map would be R2, green, one, blue, one. So we're just defining a type alias. It's a weak type def. A color map is a map from color to int. Section three, we deal with the maps. We are making uh, make maps of color to int. So first, get it or zero, a simple helper function that we declare on the side so we can use it later. Some people have cheated on that one and used pattern matching and say, well, get of zero, zero of nothing is zero, and get int or zero of just x is x. That works. However, there's many ways to make it simpler. Well, one way to make it simpler. You might remember from section four yesterday, and if you have a look at the documentation for maybe, there is a function named from maybe that takes a default value. Why doesn't it complete? It takes a default value, in this case, zero, and our maybe int, and we'll try to extract a thing out of it. And if there's nothing, use the default value. So that avoids, avoids having to match, which is always better. And the other thing is, what happens if we partially apply from maybe on zero? Because from maybe is a function of two arguments. Take the default value, then the maybe. But again, a function of, of two arguments is a function that takes one argument and returns a function. So if we partially apply from maybe on zero, the return type of, the, of this is function from maybe int to int. So get int or zero is simply from maybe zero. We don't even need to name the thing on which we are operating. And that style of, of, of writing where we declare functions by just chaining functions that already exist without naming the arguments is named point freestyle because we don't name the points of data on which we operate. Okay, so get count. There are several ways to implement get count. I was suggesting using the lookup, I was forcing you to use the lookup function, which takes a key, a map, returns the maybe value. Of course, it returns a maybe value because that key might not be in the map. So if we use this lookup function using our color as the key and the map as the map, what we get out of it is a maybe int. And we want an int out of that, this get count. And conveniently, the int we want in the case where there's nothing is zero. So we can simply use get int or zero of the lookup of a color in the map. If you don't like dollar, you can, of course, write explicit parentheses. If you like point freestyle, some people have seen this and, and thought, well, CMAP here is the same at the end of the arguments and at the end of the line here. Can we remove it on both sides? The answer is yes, if we use the dot thing instead of dollar here. Because look at it this way, lookup partially applied to color is a function from map to maybe value. Get int of zero is a function from maybe int to int. So dot of them will create a function from map to int, which is what get count color is. It's a function from map to int. But that's kind of counterintuitive, right? Why can't we remove color as well? So that thing here, the way to remove color, is something I usually don't talk about because it's explicitly forbidden in the Google Haskell style guide. But someone asked me, so I have to give the answer. Oh. So, so if you want to play with this, 
we were going to need some operator because the problem here is get int or zero takes one argument, returns one thing, while lookup takes two arguments. So we need some kind of dot function that is able to chain to add a single argument function after a two arguments function. So you might remember dot, it already exists, so I'm not going to redefine it, but remember dot would be defined this way f dot g is so f dot g is a fun is a function that takes some x and does f of g of x that would be the mathematical notation in haskell it would be of course f of g of x of course that already exists i've just redefined it but that's okay so that's would be would be dots what we would need would be something that's name it dot 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 that actually takes two arguments x and y and does does f of g x y if we had such a dot 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 thing we could write get int or zero dot 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 lookup this thing is forbidden in the in the style guide because it's kind of it's kind of not very readable i'm used to it so i like it but that's just me and also it has a very interesting property which is why it's it's infamous See, the thing is, if we write it explicitly as a function, this is the dot, dot, dot function, which takes f, g, x, y, and returns f of g, x, y. Well, perhaps we can remove the last argument, the y, and make this f dot g, x, and so on. What happens when we finally manage to remove all the arguments to dot, 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 and we express dot, dot, dot itself in point freestyle. It turns out the way to express dot, dot, dot in point freestyle is simply dot, dot, dot. <laughs> right? <laughs> Which is why it's usually named dot, dot, dot. And also the reason why it's forbidden not to use it. Homework, if that kind of stuff amuses you, Try to, on paper, do the steps to end up with the dot, dot and see how it works. It's fascinating. Also, it's forbidden, by the way. But yes, if you wanted to write a get count without the arguments, you would need to use that kind of stuff. That's the kind of stuff, as a beginner, I, I, I usually would do all the time because it's fascinating to play with it. Now that I have been writing Haskell for a few years, I will actually write the arguments in all the names because it's, it's way easier to read. Okay with this? If you didn't get that, it's fine. It's perfectly fine. Since anyway, it's forbidden here. Okay, and finally, add color to the map. So I, what, I, what I want to do here is we want to get the current count of a given color in the map, which might be zero if, if the key is not in the map, and insert that count plus one in the map. So what we can do, let's say that the current count is get count of that color in the map. We can then do in insert uh, insert first takes the key which is color then current count let me put that on a new line it's gonna be easier to read insert for that color the current count plus one in the map um a thing is when you have functions that transform data structures like lists or maps or something usually they put the thing they transform as the last argument. Because if you partially apply the two first arguments, you end up with a function that transforms a map into a map. Which means if you have several transformations you want to apply in a row, you can create several functions from map to map and just chain them with dollar or dot. So usually anything that deals with a data structure will have, especially if it transforms it, will have that structure as the last argument. It's the case here with the insert. So that works. If you can also use a where block if you don't like let in. So you can say it's insert color of current count plus one in the map where current count is get count of that color in the map. Of course, if you prefer an inline version, you can just inline it completely. There's nothing wrong with this. And I was suggesting looking up insert with. It's a better solution. It's a fancier version because it's a one liner and it's shorter. I wouldn't say it's a best, better version because it's a bit more complicated, but it's pretty fun. So as usual convention, when you have two different functions, one like insert and the other insert with or insert by, the insert with or by is the generic version that takes a function as the first argument, and the non-generic, like insert, 
presupposes a given function. So insert with its type is almost the same as insert, except it takes one more thing, which is a function that combines to int. Of course, there would be two values, but here I'm specifying for the case of our column map. And what insert with does is it takes a function which allows you to say what is supposed to happen when you're trying to insert a key in the map, but the key already exists. What insert does is just use insert with, and what the function in the case of insert does is ignore the old value, just keep the new one. Which means if you use insert and the key already existed, the old value is discarded and the new one is used. What we can do, however, is use a better combination version and do insert with plus. Because what do we want to insert if there was no such key in the map? We want to insert one because there was no, no color in the map. We want to insert one because now, that, now there is. And how do we want to combine the old value and the new value? Well, we want to do plus one on the old one if they already existed. So if we give plus, if there was no such key in the map, it's going to insert our value here, one. If there was already a value in the map, it's going to combine our new value one with the old value using plus. And it's going to insert, therefore, the old value plus one. This one is a bit more fancy, but it's fun. I don't think I have anything in the game file for section three. No, I don't. So onward to section four. In section four, we define a few things. We say that the code is simply a list of colors, nothing more. And score is a simple struct that has two fields, the number of black pins, the number of white pins. That's all we need for section four. So section four, first of all, we need to generate all the codes of a given size. So the way we do this is, of course, recursively. We generate all the codes of size s minus 1. And when we have them, then for all the colors and all the codes, we do a cross product, a double loop. And we take all the codes of the size s minus 1, all the possible colors, and we just create the combination of those two. So we're going to use several things. We're going to use the guard syntax to like, choose which implementation to choose based on the value of our parameter s. So if s is less than 0, we assume something went terribly wrong in our program because it's never supposed to happen. And it's a constant in the game to start with. So we just crash and panic. In the case where it's 0, a lot of people say, well, there's nothing. That's not true. There is one code of size 0, even though it's a very uninteresting code. And playing the game with a code of size 0, it's going to be boring. There is the empty code, which is of size 0 which is a valid code. So the list of all the codes of size 0 is the list that contains the empty list. Otherwise, now that we have the base case of our recursion, how do we create the codes of size s based on the codes of size s minus 1? So this is a list comprehension syntax. In Python, that would be for color in something, for color, that's something in something else. But this is Haskell, not Python, so we use operators and not words. So what are the two things for which we want to do cross product? Well, color, all the colors we want to combine with all the codes of size S minus 1. Color is from all colors. And code is simply all the codes of size S minus 1. Does that make sense, more or less? OK for everyone? OK, perfect. Then we want to have a way to transform a given code into the map, into the, 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 the color map. So the thing is, going through a list of values and changing an accumulator at every step, that's a fold. We could, of course, write a recursion. Code to map of an empty code is empty, and code to map of a given color and the rest of the color is. But we don't need to do that because it's simply a fold. So we're going to fold. How do we combine our accumulator and the, our result is going to be a map? The elements in our list are colors, because a code is simply a list of color. How do we combine one element, which is a color, with the accumulator, which is a map, to create a new map? Well, we happen to have add color to map, which is exactly the type which is expected by fold R. So we could just say add color to map. 
Then the map, which is the default accumulator when the list is empty, which is the base case of our recursion, which is the empty map. And finally, the code on which we operate, which is code. Is that clear for everyone, or do you want me to explain how that works step by step? Everyone fine? OK, perfect. Of course, again, we don't need to name the code, because if we partially apply the fold, that's exactly the same thing. OK, so finally, no, not finally, almost finally, count blacks. We want to count the number of black pins. The way we do this is we go through the two codes side by side, and we look at the number of times where the two colors match. You might remember zip with from yesterday. So zip with combines two lists index by index, like together. And instead of just creating a tuple, like zip does, zip with allows us to specify how to combine the two elements at the same index. Of course, if we combine with equal equal, what we're going to end up with is a list of Boolean values. True if the two were the same, false if the two were different. What we want to do at this point is simply count the number of times we have true in the list. What I suggest here, there's several other ways of doing this, would be to map from enum. From enum is from the enum type class and converts a value, if the type is enum, to an integer value. What does it do for Boolean values? Well, from enum false is 0, from enum true is 1. So if we map from enum, that list of Boolean values becomes transformed into a list of int values, 0 if it were false, 1 if it were true. And I just have to do the sum, and I get the number of times the two colors were the same. Of course, there are several other ways to implement it. You could choose to instead use a filter and keep the zip width, and you have still a list of Boolean value. But you filter to only keep the ones which are true, and your predicate is just the identity function, because you want to keep if something is true, you want to keep it. If something is false, you want to keep it. You're you want to discard it. Your predicate is something that takes that value and returns true if you want to keep it, false if you want to keep it. So if it's true, you want to return true. If it's false, you want to return false. ID is the identity function that just returns its argument. So if we filter with ID, we're going to keep only a list of Boolean values that are true. And in which, which case, we just need to compute the length. Of course, you could also choose not to express it as a, a series of dollar uh, pipelines, we could also just say, well, it's length of whatever, maybe sum, let's choose sum, of 1 for A and B in zip L1, L2, if A equal equals B, which is the list comprehension syntax. We, we zip the two lists, we go through them, we go through the tuples that are being generated. We, if there the two values are equal, we with one, and we end up with a list of ones, and we just do the sum. There are many ways to implement it. I was just, just suggesting that one to make you play with dollars. Almost finally, count total. So that one is a bit weird. The thing to realize is the number, the total number of pins is going to be for a given color, red, for instance. We count the number of red pins in a code, the number of red pins in the other code, and we take the minimum of those two values. Because if I suggest four reds, and the actual code contains two reds, Two of those are going to be pins. So two again, the minimum. And if I suggest two reds with the four, the code contains four, again, those two reds are going to be two pins. So we take the minimum of the two values between the two maps. So first, we need to create the two maps out of our code. So we have the code C1, C2. We just call code to map on both of them. Code to map on both of them, which gives us the two color maps on which we can operate. For a given color, whatever it is, we want to compute the number of pins for that color, which is the number, the minimum of the values in the two maps, which is going to be minimum of get count of that color in the first map, cmap1, and get count of that color in cmap2. If you're thinking, well, we're just calling min on two on cmap1 and cmap2, and we just transform the things before computing the min. If there is a thing in data.function, which is named on, which allows us to do such a thing as minimum on get count color. And what it does is it takes on the left a binary function that takes two arguments, on the right a transformation function. And what it does is apply that transformation function 
on the two arguments and then apply the combination functions. The, the combination function. If you think this is less readable, there's absolutely nothing wrong with writing the full version. Okay, and finally, count score, which is almost given. You use the, just a do block to introduce the things. Oh, I missed something. Yes, absolutely right. Thank you. So we want to compare color for all the colors. So all the colors is all colors, and we simply simply map compare color for every single color. That gives us the number of pins per color, so in the list of ints, and we just compute the sum. Black is simply count, blacks I can't type, I'm sorry, of C1 and C2. Total is count total, it's the other way around, of C1 and C2. And white is simply total minus black. And to create a score structure, we call the score constructor, which has two arguments. First, number of black pins, and then the number of white pins. And let me just check that I haven't made any mistake. And if I haven't, it is done. I'm going to, I have eight minutes left. I'm going to show you a quick, no, not that one. I'll show you a quick tour of what else is left in the game, in the game file. So first section four, we have the instance of show for score, our small struct, where they're saying, well, it's black and a number of black pins, comma, white and a number of white pins, pretty simple. And we have read code, which is very interesting. Read code takes a string and returns an error or code. So code, again, is just a list of color. So what it does is sequence dot map read color. So if you remember, read color takes a character, returns a error or color. So after doing this step, this map read color will transform in our string into Oops, which is a list of characters, of characters. It will transform it into a list of error or color. What sequence does is transform the list of error or color into an error or list of color. It's defined on monads. And what it does is it goes through the list left to right and and out extracts the monad, well, moves the monad out of the list and gives you the list of values inside the monad. It transforms the list of monadic values into a monadic list of values. Homework, implement sequence. It's actually not hard. And it's a very interesting, ex uh, it's a very interesting thing to do. And you will also realize that it doesn't need monad. You can implement it only using applicative. You actually want monad because you actually want it to be sequential. Uh, so yeah, homework, implement sequence, and then you will see how this works. Finally, the solver. So the solver is defined in an extremely naive way. We define a history as being a list of tuples, which codes we've, tri we've tried, what score they got. And we have a check function that takes the history of what has been played so far, a given code, and tell us, tells us whether the code we, we are giving as input is consistent with everything we've seen so far. How, does we, how do we do this? We use the, the all function, all takes a predicate consistent with candidate and applies it to every single element in the list. And it returns true if all the elements pass the predicate. It's basically end map the predicate. So what is what it means to be consistent with the candidate for a given history and tree? It just means that if we count the score of that old code we had tried with our candidate, we get the same score as we had in the past. If we do, it means our new code, our candidate, is consistent with what we had tried before. And if all our historical items are consistent with our candidate, it means, yes, our candidate is potentially the good code. And what our naive solver does is extremely simple. For a given code size, for a given history, takes all the codes, filter to only keep the ones which are consistent with our, our history, and returns the first one. Of course, if you want to make it better, that's the part you have to change. To instead of just picking the first code that matches, rank them by how much information they would get you and return the best one. Of course, you don't need to write it using a let in. You could just like write it in just one pipeline using those. Section six is the one where we finally do some IO and use do blocks. 
So we have validate code, which uses a do block inside the error or monad that we have defined. So validate code takes an int, which is the size of the code we're expecting, and a string, which is our input. And what it does is do several things into the error or monad, and either all of them pass and we get the, the code, or one of them returns an error message and we end up with the error message. So first, we read code. Again, read code gives us an error or code. We use the left arrow to locally bind it into code. This would be translated in, in actually read code, input code, input bind something, which is code and does the next thing. But we don't want to write this. We just write left arrow code. At this point, given the way we have implemented bind, if this returns an error, we are just going to propagate the error because we can't apply more functions on it. But under, since it does that for us, we can just write code as if, uh, I mean, can, we can write stuff as if this code here was a proper code. And what we can do is just use it as a normal code and say, well, if length of the code equals the size, then we return our entire function returns just the code. Otherwise, it returns an error, expecting the code of size and show the size. Finally, get code. Get code reads a code from the standard input. It prints a prompt, flushes a CD out, gets a line, completely imperative code because we are in a do block in IO. And we call validate code, which gives us an error or code. We use case of to pattern match against it. If there was an error message, we print the error message and we call get code recursively to just loop. If it gives us a value, which is the code, we just return the code. We define input, which is a function which takes two ints, uh, the size of the code, the number of times we have played so far, the history, and returns the next code to try, which is in IO. The human input is just ignore the history and use the get code function we have defined. The computer input, ignore the turn number, use the history, use the naive solver, and this thing is pure, and we use return to put it in IO. Finally, and the very first version I mentioned yesterday in 101, the first time it was only two hours for everything from the beginning of 101 to the end of 102, it had play equals code lab, and I've been told it's a bit too hard. So play takes the actual secret code, the answer, the maximum number of turns, which is like the limit, the input function is the computer playing with the human playing, and performs an IO action. All it does is print the list of valid colors, print the size of the answer, print the number of tries, prints good luck, and place turn one. And play, playing a turn is either, well, the turn is greater than the maximum number of turns, print, sorry, you lost. Otherwise, we open a do block in IO. And what we do is we input, we get the code by using input, which gives us a code, which is in IO, but it's an actual code. If it's the answer, we print, well done. If it's not, we need another IO expression because everything here is in IO. We can open another do block because a do block is an expression in IO. We just say that the score is, we can comp compute the score of the, of the thing which was given to us. We print, hey, that code gave that score. And we play the next turn and we add the code and the score it got to the history. And that's all for play. Section seven is random generation, but I'm, I'm going to skip it. It's just, just use the random type class and make the color type an instance of the random type class so we can use the random function to generate random colors. It's pure random, it doesn't use AO. And finally, section eight is the constants. So max turn is eight, code size is four, and the seed is 756 for reasons. And that's what I have for you. I have, I'm, I'm going to still be here for 10 minutes if you have questions, but otherwise, I hope you had fun. And Stay tuned for World 3, perhaps at some point. 